of Jesus. If you are watching this on LiveGate Outreach TV or listening to the audio versions on any of our platforms, uh, on CD or on podcast, I want you to know that the Lord will also bless you right where you are, in Jesus' name. Praise the Lord. For about four weeks, this is the fourth Sunday, we started a series on Romans chapter 8, verse 29, and um, we said that um, we're looking at the four mysteries there, the mystery of foreknowledge, the mystery of predestination, the mystery of godly conformity. And uh, the fourth one we looked at, or we're looking at this morning, is the mystery of joint inheritance. I believe we have a banner for it. Uh, every week we've only highlighted the four different things from that, and um, I pray that the Lord will honor your faith as you follow. Yes, can I have the banner again? So we have the mystery of joint inheritance today. Praise the Lord. So it's the fourth in that series, and we're looking at this month, we are looking at Romans chapter 8, verse 29 and verse 30. And uh, we will be looking extensively at verse 30 at our victory prayer night on Friday. So I want to encourage you to come. It is going to culminate into the summation of everything we have been discussing right from the very first Sunday in the month of September. And so the mystery of our joint inheritance is the buildup of what God said when we read Romans 8, 29. Let's read it together again. He said, for... Whom he foreknew, read it with me please. For whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. We are to conform, last week, go back to verse. We are to conform, please go back to that verse. We are to conform to the image of his son. Last week we looked at the mystery of godly conformity and we said that God's desire is that we conform to the image of his son Jesus Christ. Just to quickly recapitulate, I said to you when God created man in the garden of Eden in Genesis, the Bible says he made man in his own image and after his likeness. Man then fell and man was thrown out of that warm fellowship with God. And what happened is Jesus, God in his wisdom sent Jesus Christ his son to come and die for us so that we can be redeemed and become adopted. And he became the firstborn. The Bible says, for God so loved the world, he gave his only, the only begotten son. No one else, including you and I, is begotten like Jesus was. But the death of that begotten son gave us the ability and the power to become adopted sons. Praise the Lord. And if you understand the principle of adoption, you know very well that adoption gives equal access and equal rights to every son and every child in a household. Praise the Lord. And so the Bible says we are then to conform to that image by reason of our redemption and our adoption. But the, the key thing there is that he wants us to be the firstborn, and he wants us to be the brethren among whom Jesus Christ remains the firstborn. Amen. Amen. So the mystery of our joint inheritance with Jesus Christ is what I want to try to take you through in the next few minutes. This is a deep mystery like the whole verse is, but I want to believe God that the few things I'll be able to touch on this morning will help you to understand who you are as a child of God and a, as a son of God. Ephesians chapter 1, we read the whole verses from 1 to 14 ever since we've been on this series it has been our scripture reading from verse 11 the bible says in him also that is in jesus also we have obtained an inheritance this is ephesians 1 11. we have obtained an inheritance being predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to what the counsel of his will verse 12 that we who first trusted in Christ should be to the praise of his glory. In him, verse 13, you also trusted after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of salvation, in whom also, having believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. Verse 14, let's read it together. The Holy Spirit of promise. Who is the guarantee of our inheritance until the redemption 
of the purchased possession to the praise of his glory. Hallelujah. So I want us all to understand that we are on a journey to glory. The Bible says, ever since we've been reading, the Bible says, for in him whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. And as we know in verse 30, the Bible says, for those ones whom he foreknew, them he also called, and them whom he called, he justified, and them whom he justified, he glorified. So the end of all this is complete and total glory. We are on a process of glorification. Being adopted sons, we are being clothed from one image of glory onto the other. According to 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18, he said we are being transformed from one image of glory onto the other. So as a child of God, your life is rescued from the dominion of darkness, brought into the kingdom of light, and then God beautifies, should beautify your life as you progress. And then the ultimate goal of God is so that you make all the inheritance or have access to all the inheritance that is in Jesus Christ. Let's read Romans chapter 8 verse 14. The Bible says, read it with me very quickly. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are sons of God. Verse 15. For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear. But you receive the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. Verse 16 says, The spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. Verse 17. And if children, then heirs. Heirs of God and what? Joint heirs with Christ. If indeed we suffer with him, that we might also be glorified together. Verse 18 says, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. There is a suffering of this present time. The pain of waiting, the pain of persecution, the suffering of every kind of trial that we go through. You see, many years ago, many people were told that once you get born again, then all the troubles of your life is over. And a lot of people grew up and are still growing up with this very erroneous belief. Now, it has an element of truth, but it is not the whole truth. And the element of truth in it is that whatever challenges come your way, as a child of God, you are fully covered. The Bible says he will give his angels charge over you. He will not allow your feet to be moved. He will not allow you to stumble. So you are in a covenant relationship with God. He is watching over you. He is ensuring that no evil truly befalls you. However, you must understand that he is not going to stop trouble. He is not going to stop you from going through challenges and fires. The Bible says when you pass through the fires, when you pass through the floods. And so I want you to understand that as Christians, we are not exempted from the troubles and the trials of this world. What we are exempted from is the same consequences that happens to the children of disobedience and those to whom God's wrath are constantly released because we have been saved from that dominion of darkness into the kingdom of his dear son, the kingdom of light. Praise the Lord. So we must understand this. When we have this understanding, it gives us better grasp of our spiritual life. It makes it difficult and virtually impossible for the enemy to discuss matters of depression, oppression, and those kind of matters that weigh us down anymore because we have an understanding that we have been redeemed and are made joint heirs with Christ. So the Bible in verse 17 and 18 emphasizes that there is a suffering of this present time. And I decree that in your life, whatever the suffering may be right now, especially for your standing for your faith, 
for your refusing the compromise of this end time. For your determining to go on serving God despite the challenges of the modern day. For your availing your talents, your ability, your gifting, your money, your resources despite the difficulties of working around study, working around work and business in this day and age. And for giving up some of the luxuries of life, some of the vacations, some of the things that you could easily do. Giving it up at times just so that you can continue to stay in the place of serving God and for those kind of sufferings, giving up your sleep at times to have to pray in the night, giving up your, 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 your time, your, your personal time at times, sacrificing it so that you can attend to the need of somebody who is crying, somebody who is desperate, somebody who needs a touch of God and you have been sent as an agent to be that person to reach them with the love of God. For doing all those things and suffering for doing them. I want you to know that they are just the sufferings of this present time and they are nothing to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. I said the glory shall be greater. In the name of Jesus, we will be looking at the glory of the latter house on Friday and I just, I want to appeal to you. I wish everyone here this morning can be here on Friday. It's going to be powerful. We'll be looking at the glory of the latter house and understand the role and the place of the glory of the former. So that we know that the glory of the former is not altogether useless. Because the Bible says the glory of the latter shall be greater than the glory of the former. So we have a greater glory that is coming, but we have a glory that we are enjoying right now. By reason of our joint inheritance. And may we continue to take delivery in Jesus' name. So God's children through Jesus Christ, according to John chapter 1 verse 12, the Bible says as many that uh, believe, he gave the power to become the sons of God. And the Bible says in Galatians 3, 29, and if you are Christ's, look at your neighbor for me and say, and if you are Christ's, say you. Look at them, say you. I mean you are Abraham's seed. And you are also a heir According to the promise. Say you. I mean you. Do you believe? What did they say? Oh, they don't understand. <laughs> I believe. The Bible says if you are Christ, if I am Christ, then it's simple. That is what gives me the right to say Abraham's blessings are mine. How many of you have ever sang that song? You can sing it because the Bible says you are Christ's. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. If you are Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. The promise on Abraham, on the promise of blessing, the promise of increase. He said, I will bless you and you shall be a blessing. That was the promise to Abraham. Hallelujah. We must understand that we are also heirs according to that promise. When we have this understanding we minimize some of the worries and our troubles of life. Praise the Lord. The Bible says in other verses as well, Matthew 25, 34, you can note that, Colossians 1, 12, telling us that we are also heirs. So being a co-heir with Christ means that as God's adopted children, we share in the inheritance of Jesus. Whatever belongs to Jesus belongs to us. Many of us do not understand this. But you see, when you understand adoption from the earthly world and how it operates, then it will be clear to you. When a child is born, there are children that are born into some settings that is truly just purely poverty. Just poverty. They were born there by reason of biological natural birth. And they were born into those places. Now, some of those children have gotten adoption into wealthier families. Some taken out of those countries, taken to wealthier nations, and as soon as they are taken out of those settings and brought into the new place, the place of wealth, you can see the physical transformation, you can see the total transformation of such children. How many people understand what I'm saying? This is exactly how it works in the spirit. It works like that in the spirit. We have a status of Impurity, a status of sin 
a status of oppression, confused, de dejected, once we are not born again. But the Bible says the moment we give our lives to Jesus Christ, we become joint heirs with him, and then we become Christ. And then the promise that is unto Abraham, the promise of the blessing, now comes on every one of us. The same way that promise is resident in Jesus Christ in the New Testament. The Bible says that God gave him as an inheritance, and he gave him the glory. So the first thing that Jesus gives to us, I'll just give you three things that summarizes what we enjoy as this inheritance. The first thing is that he gives us his glory. Somebody say his glory. When we talk about the glory of God, Jesus prayed in John chapter 17, verse 22. Let's look at it. He said, and uh, let's read together. And the glory which you gave me, I have what? Given them that they may be one just as we are one. He was praying for the disciples. He said, Lord, Father, the glory that you gave me, I have given them. He did not say, I will give them. So there is a glory that you and I are enjoying right now on our way to the eternal glory that we will enjoy forevermore. There is a glory that we have already received. And that glory is to help us first to walk together as a body of Christ, as brethren. Because he is the firstborn. He gave us that glory. And he says his desire is that we walk together as one. And therefore, this is one thing we must understand. That glory manifests upon the body of Christ in the place of unity. And so the devil does everything he can across the world to do everything he can to disunite saints because he knows that the glory of this house, the glory of this dispensation is tied to the unity in the body of Christ. Praise the Lord. And so whatever it takes, we must always ensure that we stay united. We stay a people that are working together with one purpose, with one mission, so that we can continue to enjoy that glory. This glory talks about God's presence. This glory talks about his favor. This glory talks about his beauty, his honor. He talks about his magnificence. We need to understand things about the glory of God. That when the glory of God is upon a man, his life is indescribable. His progress cannot be fathomed by the human mind. His ways are past finding out. That is why I always quote to you what Nicodemus said to Jesus very powerfully. He said, I see that you are doing some things, but no one can do these things except God be with him. That is the glory. The glory makes you do what it is. What is, it, what is seemingly impossible by the human mind. I rest my case with you by all sense of humility and by God's grace that I enjoy that glory. I understand that many things I do and I've been privileged to do for well over two decades now, I cannot explain. I cannot in any way rationalize how certain things work together for good for me. And I understand that this is not a personal thing. It is what is meant to be part and parcel of the life of a believer. Praise the Lord. And so I decree today that whatever is stealing God's glory from your life or covering your glory, my God will cause you to be delivered from it today. In the name of Jesus. The Bible says you are the light of the world. You are the hope of the world. You are the city set on a hill that cannot be hid. He said no man lights a candle and then puts it under a bushel. The devil always tries to cover the glory of the saints. He always tries to make your testimony a mockery. Always tries to make your, your life a life that does not have something to show forth. But I want you to know, every time, the Bible says they appear from strength to strength. Every one of them, as they appear in Zion, they go from strength to strength. I decree that you will be moving from strength to strength. I say you will be moving from glory to glory. In the name of Jesus. So the first thing that he shares with us is his glory. When we have that glory, our life is honorable. When we have that glory, our life is beautiful. I have never seen an ugly saint. Every believer that I have met, every one person I've met is so beautiful. And I mean physically beautiful. 
Because no matter how you are created and fashioned out, when that glory comes on you, you become another man. Hallelujah. And I mean what I say. It transforms you from the inside to the outside. You need to see a person rescued from darkness and coming into this light in sincerity. After one month, two months, you look at them and you see them again and you wonder. You say, is it the same person? They are changed because that glory takes away everything that is dross from your life. I say it will continue to remove every filthiness in the name of Jesus. So Christ gives us his glory. Then secondly, he gives us his riches. 2 Corinthians chapter 8 verse 9. Let's read that together. For you know, you have it? For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that you through his poverty might become rich. The word rich there means wealth. It means divine wealth. And I've told you, those of you that are here and have heard this many times, that wealth in the kingdom of God is not just about money. Money is part of it. But the key thing about wealth is the ability to always have sufficient to do every commanded God mandate. Everything God asks you to do, you have enough to do. This was how Jesus showed us wealth. He was never at any time in a place where they said something was needed and he did not have a solution for it. Check your scriptures. When they needed wine, he didn't ask them to go and get money. He just simply spoke a word. And the word he spoke made wine available. Praise the Lord. Of course, when they said he had to pay money, he made sure that money was available. When they said his, his disciples were not paying taxes, he made sure that money was available and they paid the tax. He said, go and pay it. Hallelujah. Divine wealth will continue to be your portion. God will now lift up your two hands and look at your hands and say, these hands will continually receive the inheritance of divine wealth divine blessings whatever i lay these hands upon to do in righteousness shall prosper i shall excel by the power of god in the name of jesus some of you don't know what you have just prayed you see when you pray and you believe god for this very prayer point you will start to see god work out things in your life that are beyond your comprehension you need to expand your mind you need to expand your mind and to believe God. Hallelujah. I say you need to believe God. May the Lord grant you the faith to believe him indeed. In the name of Jesus. I want you to fully be rest assured that when the Bible says you have joint inheritance with Christ, it simply means that everything you saw Christ have, everything you saw him manifest while he was here physically on earth is yours to possess as well. And it shall be yours indeed in Jesus name. The third thing is what the Bible calls all things. So the first thing is what? We get his glory. The second thing is we get his what? Riches. And third thing is all things. Say we get all things. Hebrews chapter 1 from verse 1. And I'll explain that very shortly. God who at various times in various ways spoke in time past to the fathers by the prophets. Verse 2. Hebrews 1-2. Has, let's read that together. Has in these last days spoken to us by his son, whom he has appointed heir of, through whom also he made the worlds. God has app appointed him heir of all things, and we are joint heirs with him. What that means is that God, by reason of this divine inheritance, has now put you and I in a situation above all things. I say you have been put above all things. In the name of Jesus. Friends, I want you to understand something about God. Whatever you believe and however much you can expect and see of him is exactly what he's able to do. Praise the Lord. There was a widow that was not having money to pay and uh, her life was being threatened. 
her sons were going to be confiscated. And uh, the Bible says that the servant of God was sent to that woman and he said, get jars of oil. And this very one jar that you have, begin to pour it. And as she was pouring it into every vessel, they were getting filled. The next one will get filled. Supernaturally, they were getting filled. And more and more were getting filled. And the Bible says, when there were no more jars, the oil stopped. Praise the Lord. How many of us know that story? When there were no more jars, the oil stopped. Everywhere your expectation and your capacity reaches is the much to which the Holy Spirit can do. You have to expand your mind. You cannot expand your mind by reading the things of this world. The news of the world, CNN, BBC, they cannot expand your mind. In fact, they constrict your mind. Because they tell you things that make you scared. And things that give you a fear of the future. But when you go into this world, and he says, I know the thoughts that I think towards you. They are of good and not of evil. To give you a future and a hope. And you believe it, your mind enlarges. If he says to you, I know that I am taking you from glory to glory and I shall make you the head and not the tail and you can meditate on it, your mind enlarges. Praise the Lord. You need to know how to expand your mind so that God can truly make you a joint heir over all things. You walk in the confidence of that, you walk in the assurance of that everywhere you go, you know that you are master over all things. I have never seen any problem on this earth since I understood this scripture that came my way and I, I stood there helpless. Never, never, never. Because there is something about God that when it comes, even when you don't know what to do, as soon as you say, Lord, I believe you for the wisdom from on high, God begins to expand your mind. Many times the solution to many problems are not in your head. I have always told you this. They are in somebody's head. And what you need to hear from heaven is to know who that head is. And give them a ring or get them involved. But somehow the devil makes us think that you have to be able to have every solution every time. No. Many times the thing that you need for your next level is locked in somebody else. And what God will do is not to tell you what to do, but to tell you how to get to them. Praise the Lord. And I pray God will continue to help us in all these matters. In the name of Jesus. So as I conclude this, this morning, I want to just emphasize the place of full sonship. Sonship is very important in the scheme of things. Now, the Bible uses the word children and sons interchangeably a lot, but in understanding the scripture, we can understand that there is a place for growing from childhood to sonship. Every one of us is adopted as a son, but we begin our journey as babes. We begin as children, as babes. But what God is expecting for us to be able to enjoy the inheritance jointly with Jesus is that we become sons. Look at how God, uh, how Paul addressed this in Galatians chapter 4 from verse 1. Let's read together. Galatians 4, 1. Let's read together. We're going to read seven verses, so let's read quickly. Now I say that the heir, as long as he is a, does not differ at all from a, Though he is, can you see that? He is the master. But as long as he is a child, there is no difference from the slave that you have to tell everything to do. The son knows the things to do and where to get everything. But you have to command a slave. You have to guide a slave. Even though the slave lives, they don't have the same right. But the Bible says as long as that child, as long as that heir remains a child, he does not differ from a slave. Hallelujah. Verse 2 says, but he is what? Under guardians. Verse 2, go back to verse 2. But he is under guardians and stewards until the time appointed by the Father. Verse 3, Even so, we, when we were, keep reading, when we were children, we were in bondage under the elements of the world. Verse 4, 
But when the fullness of the time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law. Verse 5. To redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive the adoption as what? Sons. Verse 6. Let's shout that together. And because you are sons, God sent forth the spirit of his son into your heart, crying, Abba, Father. Verse 7. Therefore, you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. Now look at that, your neighbor again, and tell them for me. Say, therefore, you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if you are a son, then you are also an heir of God through Christ. Hallelujah. We must understand that we need to become sons. Romans 8, 14 says, For as many that are led by the Spirit of God, they are. These are. Can I have Romans 8, 14? We had read it before. Romans 8, 14. These are. As many as are led by the Spirit of God. These are. These are sons of God. I pray that the power of the Holy Spirit to lead you will continue to be your portion. Not only will it be available to you, I pray that you will allow the Spirit of God to keep leading you. In the name of Jesus. The Bible says these are the sons of God. That is where the qualification comes. What does that mean? It means that those that have sold out their lives, those that have said, Lord, here am I. Use me. Send me. Those that are willing to give up comfort as it is demanded for. Those that are willing to go left. When the Holy, when the Holy Spirit says go left, even though they would have preferred to go right. Those that are willing to just obey God and do the will of God. These are those that are led by the Spirit and these are the sons of God. In physical terms, it manifests by maturity. It manifests by growing. A few days ago, about a, a couple of weeks ago, the world was shown the picture of Prince George going to school for the very first time in his life. And uh, all over the world, obviously, very popular, probably the most popular family on the planet. The pictures were beamed all over the place where his father, Prince William, was handing him over to the school teacher on his first day at school. How many of you saw that? I'm sure you must have seen that. You, must have. you didn't see it. God have mercy on you all. <laughs> that was the picture of Prince George going to school for the first time. Grandson of Prince Charles. Now, I remember a flashback around about 1986, I think. 87, 86-ish. Seeing a picture like that of Prince Charles taking Prince William himself to school. And it was broadcast like that all over the world. Now he, Williams, has become a son, in quote, a father, who can also now carry that child. Now if he remained in the mentality of the picture of 1986, would he be able to perform that duty of taking or even having a son in the first instance? It would have been impossible. So sonship comes with maturity. And it comes at a place of responsibility. Prince William today, I think he's the FA president, chairman, is he? He's the one? Yeah, he's the FA president today, and he has many other roles that he performs. Now, because he's a son, because he has matured, if he stayed in the place of immaturity, there is no way he can enjoy those things. Now, everything that he enjoys is also Prince George's right. But today, you can't give Prince George the car to any of the Rolls Royces. Can you? If you do it, they will arrest you, whoever you are. Because Prince George is still a child. That is how it is in the spirit. Everything that we have access to as joint inheritance with Christ is there for us. But we must understand, we must stay in the place of understanding the word of God. Manifesting the word of God. Using the word of God. Growing by the word of God. The Bible says that those who have exercised 
their senses, those who have exercised the things of the faith, that is maturity. And they are the ones that enjoy this inheritance we talk about. May the Lord bring you and I to the place of enjoying this divine inheritance. In the name of Jesus. It starts with giving your life to Jesus Christ. There is no one in this kingdom that can be an inheritor of anything in this kingdom without accepting Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. And so the journey starts there. But when you come, he gives you the right to become a child of God. But as we grow in our adoption, we begin to manifest the inheritance. I want you to take time to be here also on Wednesday as we will be looking into this matter some more. Everything the prodigal son had in the house before he left home was already his. But out of greed and immaturity, he went out and squandered it all. That was why when he came back, the father accepted him, but at the same time, he had wasted time and almost lost his life doing it. There is no point going away from what God has given to you. That is why when the elder brother was complaining, he said, you'd have no problem. All that I have is what? Is yours. All that God has is yours. Everything he has put in Christ is yours. Whatever you and I are not enjoying today is simply because we lack the knowledge and we lack the maturity. But today, God is making open every channel that will help us to enjoy it all. In the name of Jesus. I want you to stand to your feet with me. And just trust God that as we pray this prayer, if you are here, you have never given your life to Jesus. Well.